So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 Wayne Fleet Lecture, uh, Maudlin's Showpiece Annual Lecture. And we are delighted this evening to welcome our speaker this year, uh, mathematician and climate scientist, Professor Emily Shuckborough. Emily was a student at Maudlin reading maths in the early 1990s, and she then completed a PhD in atmospheric dynamics at the University of Cambridge, and is now a fellow of Darwin College in Cambridge. Uh, Emily is, has been a member of the Antarctic Survey, and I notice uh, has a little map of Antarctica around her neck in case we forget what it looks like, which is great. And uh, between 2010 and 2013, was scientific advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Uh, since 2019, Emily's been director of Cambridge Zero, an initiative to maximize the university's contribution towards achieving a resilient and sustainable zero carbon world. Uh, Emily is also the co-author with King Charles of the, um, uh, the, the Ladybird Book of Climate Change. Uh, so it is impossible to think of anybody uh, better suited uh, to speak tonight on the topic, the state of the climate and humanity's response. Can I invite you all please to welcome Professor Emily Chukwu. Well, thank you very much. And it, it's actually a real treat to come back to, uh, to college, especially on such a lovely day. I'm looking forward to going for a wander around Addison's Walk tomorrow morning. Um, but I'm here um, to talk about climate and the state of the climate, the state of our understanding of climate change and the state of our global response to climate change. So, but I thought I'd start off, um, this is me 30 years ago, um, 1991 when I matriculated. And in some ways it feels that very little has changed in the last 30 years. It feels like just yesterday that I was standing there um, uh, having enjoyed a walk around Addison's. But at the same time, a lot has changed in the last 30 years. In, in college's terms, actually, this building didn't exist when, uh, when I was here as a student. But more importantly, the climate has changed really significantly over the, the last 30 years, as has the politics of climate change. So this was another event that happened just over 30 years ago. This is the very first of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, um, 1990. And I've just put in um, one of the quotes from that report just to really demonstrate that 30 years ago, the science was pretty clear on the threat posed by climate change. Um, so the executive summary of that report um, stated very clearly that emissions resulting from human activities are substantially increasing the atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases, and that this will result in additional warming of the Earth's um, surface. And that has continued apace over the last 30 years. So that if we look at the world around us today, that um, at the time threat of climate change has already become a reality. So this is just some of the images from the last few months um, of uh, severe weather events that have been happening around the world. Uh, this last summer in the UK saw extreme heat in the UK, many locations across the UK reaching 40 degrees Celsius, something that back in the early 1990s was literally unimaginable. But so too have extreme weather events been happening in every place around the world. Um, we saw record uh, rainfall in parts of China and um, really severe floods affecting Pakistan, which has um, led to the displacement of huge numbers of huge numbers of people. We're now on the sixth um, cycle of the IPCC reports, and uh, the working group one of uh, which it contains the uh, physical assessment of the physical changes of the climate system um, was published last summer, and I've just picked out one of the key quotes from that report that said very clearly that human-induced climate change is now already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. Um, so that's what's happened in terms of the climate over the last 
30 years. We're now living in a very different global climate to the one that we were living in in the early 1990s. And this is how that plays out in terms of the actual numbers, in terms of the graphs. And I've picked just four key indicators of how the world has changed over, I'm showing here the last um, 150 years, but I've highlighted that 1991 um, line as the red line in each of the plots, just so you can see the scale of change over those last 30 years. Um, and I've, I've included one uh, indicator of how society has changed, um, our global energy use, and then three indicators of how the climate system has changed um, over that period. So in terms of our energy use, there's been something like a 20-fold increase in our global energy use over the last 150 um, years, 70% increase just since 1991. And you can see just how dramatically that uh, has gone up over the last 30 years. And of course, most of that energy use currently is through the use of fossil fuels and the burning of fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide. And as a consequence of that uh, use of uh, fossil fuels for energy, as well as land use changes, then we've seen a substantial increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, just over the last 30 years, there's been an increase of about 60 parts per million in terms of the atmospheric concentrations of um, carbon dioxide. And again, back in the early 1990s, even exceeding 400 parts per million in terms of atmospheric concentrations really seemed um, you know, almost inconceivable. And we're now heading towards 420 parts per million. We know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And so you would expect that increases in the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide would lead to increases in the temperature. And that's again, indeed, what we've seen. And you can see um, down here on the bottom left-hand side, um, that increase in temperature. And yet again, there's been a substantial increase just over the last 30 years. Um, these numbers seem quite small, 0.4 degrees Celsius, but I'll show in a minute um, that they actually translate into really significant increases, particularly in terms of extreme weather events. And it's not just um, temperature. That change in temperature has many other impacts on our climate system. And one of those impacts is that as the um, Earth warms up, then two other things happen as consequences of that. First of all, the water in the oceans is slowly warming up. And as the water in the oceans warms up, it literally expands in volume and that contributes to sea level rise. And then at the same time, the warming world is also resulting in melting ice around the world. And where that ice is originally sat on land and melts, it finds its ways into the ocean and, and additionally contributes to sea level rise. And you can see that steady increase in sea level rise, again, uh, with substantial change over the last 30 years. That's in terms of graphs. This is in terms of, of pictures, just a few key aspects of the climate system where we're seeing really dramatic changes, particularly in terms of the polar regions. We're seeing um, ice loss, both from Greenland in the Arctic and from Antarctica accelerating and then contributing to an acceleration of sea level rise. We've seen hugely dramatic decrease in the amount of sea ice in the Arctic over recent years. Um, this isn't land-based ice, this is sea ice. It doesn't contribute to um, sea level rise when it melts, but it's completely changing um, the Arctic region, its ecosystem, and indeed the way in which the Arctic connects into the rest of the, uh, uh, the Northern Hemisphere uh, and the impact on meteorological conditions across the Northern Hemisphere. And the other consequence of increase in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere is that um, as the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have been increasing, then much of that has found its way into the oceans resulting in um, an acidification of the oceans, which is causing extreme stress to much of our marine life. And again, um, these are just some of the data that lie behind those statements. This image here shows Greenland and Antarctica, and the red areas are the areas of particularly strong melting of those polar regions. This is showing the dramatic decrease that we've seen in the amount of the extent of sea ice in the Arctic region. And this is showing how as carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been increasing, the pH level of the oceans have been, has been dramatically 
decreasing. So what does all those changes mean? And what are the impacts um, of those changes? And what are the risks um, to society and the natural world from further change? Well, again, the IPCC reports clearly set out the scale of those risks. Um, the IPCC comes in three key reports each cycle. The first one, as I described, um, uh, gives a description of the physical state of the climate system. The second report then delves into the impacts of that climate change and the risks into the future. And I've highlighted again one of the key statements from this most recent IPCC um, report. Global warming reaching 1.5 degrees in the near term will cause unavoidable increases in multiple climate hazards and present multiple risks to ecosystems and to humans. We're currently over 1.1 degrees of warming. Um, it's uh, likely that we will at least temporarily exceed um, 1.5 degrees within the next decade. This poses genuine risks to, to humanity itself, as well as to the natural world. It's estimated that almost half the global population live in climate vulnerable hotspots. Um, and in terms of ecosystems, there are huge numbers of species that are potentially threatened as their habitats become changed as a consequence of climate change. And that's true in particular, for example, to those species living in the polar regions, which are incredibly well adapted to the cold temperatures that they experience in the, in the polar regions, but consequently also very sensitive to changes in those temperatures. And whereas many species we're seeing changing their um, distributions, uh, essentially to stay in more similar climatic conditions. If you're a species that's already living in the coldest part of the world, as that part of the world warms up, you literally have nowhere else to go. The other great concern um, with climate change is the risk of um, abrupt or potentially irreversible changes occurring. And I've just got a few examples of some of those potential changes um, in the images on the right-hand side of this, um, of this slide here. Some of the things that we're concerned about from a scientific perspective include um, the future of the Amazon rainforest, um, whether or not that continues as a rainforest or more of it moves into um, a, a more savanna related ecosystem as a consequence of the combination of climate change and deforestation. The polar regions are a cause of particular concern. I've mentioned the severe um, loss of ice from Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, we know that in the distant past, when the world has not been much warmer than it is today, then those ice sheets have not been um, intact. And as a consequence, uh, global sea levels have been many metres higher than they are today. And there's real concern that if we continue warming, surpassing 1.5 degrees, then indeed, the uh, processes will be set in train um, that lead to the uh, disintegration of much of those um, uh, key parts of those ice sheets. And then the final image that I have at the bottom on the right hand side of this um, slide, the little circle that you see is a bubble of methane coming out from um, an Arctic lake. There's vast stores of frozen methane in the Arctic, in the permafrost, in the bottom of lakes, and in, in the Arctic Ocean. And the concern there is that as the Arctic warms up, then that methane will be released into the atmosphere. And methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and could act as a significant um, acceleration. So for all these reasons, both the direct impacts on society, the direct impacts on the on the natural world and the risk of these really catastrophic events potentially occurring, there is a real concern that we simply as a global community are not um, reversing the uh, increase in emissions um, and the increase in, uh, sorry, the increase in, in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere and not reversing or um, at least halting uh, climate change. <clears throat> 
So I wanted to tell you a little bit, having given you an overview of the current state of the climate, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the research that underpins that assessment of the um, state of the, of the climate. Um, so from a climate science perspective, there are really two key areas of research um, associated with climate science. Um, one area is focused around measurements and the other area is focused around numerical modelling. And you can see here, this is a, a, a me in the uh, Southern Ocean when I was working at the British Antarctic Survey, um, taking some measurements in the, in the Southern Ocean. Um, and on the right hand side um, is a description of the way in which um, climate models, numerical computer simulations are developed to try and uh, use that in combination with the measurements to understand um, both uh, how the climate system works and how it might change into the future. And in terms of climate models, they've evolved over the last, well, 100 years um, as, uh, as weather forecasting initially, and then more, more recently as, as climate models. And at their heart, climate models are based on our understanding of the laws of physics. And what you can see is a, a simple description of a climate model, um, which in the atmosphere and the oceans is essentially solving the equations that describe the motion of the atmosphere and ocean on a grid. A representation of the atmosphere is included in the climate model, as is the representation of the o an ocean, ice sheets and, and various different processes uh, associated with the land, for example, all coupled together. And those equations in terms of a climate model are solved on a grid. You can see the grid boxes um, shown in that, uh, in that schematic. Where the challenge has been is that all the relevant processes that happen on a scale smaller than that grid have to somehow be approximated in terms of a climate model. And typically, in terms of the scale at which we exactly solve those equations, in the atmosphere, it can be as large as 100 kilometers in a typical climate model. Um, we could reduce this, that resolution, but there's always a trade-off between the amount of computer power that you have, the resolution at which you can run your computer simulations, but also the number of different processes that you want to include in your models. So there's always a limit, and we always have to approximate some things. And if you think about the scale of a cloud, for example, it's typically a lot smaller than 100 kilometers. And so, for example, key processes associated with clouds have to be represented in the climate models. I say all of this because one area of current research that um, I and my research group are involved in is looking to combine these two, two areas, the measurements and the um, computer modeling. And we're looking at how we can incorporate measurements um, associated with um, some of those processes that are not explicitly represented in the climate models through AI and machine learning to augment um, our existing uh, climate models and then improve our projections as to how the climate system may vary into the future. I wanted to just give you two examples. One example of, of a really critical measurement that's um, been really profound in terms of our understanding of um, past climate and then I'll give you one example of some of the results that come from that um, climate modelling. This is one of the most important measurements that we have um, associated with um, climate science and this comes from Antarctica. Uh, the, this is uh, data from ice cores. Um, you can see a photograph of an ice core um, on the left hand side there. What happens is that as the snow falls in Antarctica it, it, it piles up layer after layer but as it falls, it traps tiny bubbles of air in the snow and eventually gets compacted down into the ice. And it means that as we drill down through the ice, we're able to recover the actual air that was in the atmosphere in the distant past. And that's really important because it enables us to understand how natural climate changes have happened over the course of the Earth's history and how different the climate change that we've observed over the last um, century is compared to those natural climate changes. So over very long time periods of 100,000 years, the orbit of the Earth slightly varies such that when it's a little bit closer to the Sun, uh, we've been in a warmer period, and when the Earth's orbit is a bit further away from the Sun, um, we're in a cooler period, and that's what's caused naturally the Ice Age cycles on Earth. And you can see a reflection of those Ice Age cycles in this um, data which goes back 
800,000 years. It shows the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And where there's been a warmer period, um, the carbon dioxide levels have been higher. And when there's been a cooler period, um, the carbon dioxide levels have been lower. And you can see this natural cycle that's consistent with the ice age cycles on the Earth that's occurred for most of that 800,000 year history. And then you can see where today's carbon dioxide levels are vastly outside that uh, natural cycle. So in terms of the natural cycle, carbon dioxide levels varied between about 180 and 280 parts per million. And as I said earlier today, they're heading towards 420 parts per million. So that's a really critical um, measurement that shows that in terms of our atmosphere, today's atmosphere is completely unprecedented throughout all of human history, prehistory and beyond. In terms of a key modelling result, um, this is again some results that come from the most recent IPCC report. Um, this is climate modelling results looking um, at the last um, 70 years, but then projections through the rest of this century under different scenarios in terms of the amount of greenhouse gases that are put into the um, atmosphere. So under these scenarios, at the end of the century, temperature change compared to the end of the um, 19th century, second half of the 19th century, would be between about one and a half and going up towards four and a half degrees, depending on um, the amount of greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere over the course of the rest of the century. Now, one and a half to four and a half degrees sounds like relatively um, small numbers. But first of all, those are global average numbers and there's significant regional differences. And this um, image here shows um, just uh, for the middle of this century under um, the lowest scenario in terms of increased greenhouse gases, the variation in temperature um, globally. And you can see in particular that the Arctic region, as we've already seen to date, um, shows significantly more warming than the rest of the planet. But the other key thing is that these temperature changes hide what probably is more impactful both for humans and for um, the natural world, and that's the change in the risk of extreme events. Um, so we saw this last summer, temperatures in the UK reaching 40 degrees Celsius in the, uh, during the heat wave. Um, this image here at the bottom shows um, under um, this scenario, the expected increase in um, the most extreme heat wave days. And you can see all the colours that are coloured in red are areas of the world where over the next couple of decades, it's not just anticipated that the number of extreme heat, day, heat wave days would increase by a few days a year, but by literally weeks per year. Um, and that's what ends up having a really significant impact um, in terms of society. So then that comes to what do we need to do if we want to prevent that sort of scale of risk occurring? And this is now a statement from the third and final of the IPCC reports. The image shows in white dots the carbon dioxide emissions globally um, that have been observed um, year by year since 1980 through to the present day. And you can see that steady um, increase in emissions year by year with a slight tiny, tiny blip down in 2020 as a consequence of the global um, pandemic. And then in blue, you can see the broad envelope of um, emissions uh, that would be required to have a reasonable chance of keeping temperatures below 1.5 degrees. Um, and the IPCC, in terms of uh, the headline, one of the headline statements from that third assessment report, um, concluded that all global, all global models pathways that uh, limit warming in line with the Paris Agreement, so having a reasonable chance of, of keeping temperatures well below two degrees um, with an ambition to keep them below 1.5 degrees of warming involve deep, um, rapid and deep, and in most cases, immediate greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors of the economy. That's when the politics then comes in. This time last year, we, we were weeks away from uh, the big UN climate conference in Glasgow, where the world came together. Um, and uh, the hope was that Finally, um, the countries would uh, actually step up to what had been agreed in Paris in 2015 um, and put in place 
uh, both pledges, but not just pledges, but actual action to reduce uh, emissions in line with this sort of trajectory. What resulted was a Glasgow Climate Pact that called for um, accelerated action in this critical decade, but not actually the policies that um, actually underlined that. So now we're weeks away from the next um, UN climate conference uh, and we wait once more as a world to see whether or not um, the uh, rhetoric is matched by action. So what does that mean in terms of um, the UK and how we're experiencing and may into the future experience um, climate change? And these are just some of the um, statistics around the actual impacts for the UK that we've been um, observing in recent years. This last summer, with those extreme um, temperatures, um, it's estimated that there were uh, almost 3,000 heat-related deaths, particularly amongst the elderly um, during the hottest parts of the summer. Um, flooding has been something that has repeatedly affected communities across the UK and has now um, estimated that um, many years the uh, cost uh, associated with flooding events amounts to some billion pounds um, in 2015-2016 uh, it was estimated that the overall cost of the flooding that winter um, came to some 1.6 billion pounds these are costs um, in economic terms but those communities that have been affected by flooding um, if you speak to any people in those communities it's really traumatic experience um, when they see literally their homes or livelihoods being washed away. We're seeing the impact in, in the UK in terms of our, our natural world um, with many of our critical species um, being impacted by changing climatic um, conditions but also we're seeing it in terms of um, other parts of our economy, particularly in terms of agriculture, extreme weather conditions can have dramatic impacts on the profits of the agricultural sector. And perhaps one area that we're only really starting to fully understand is how all these things are interconnected and um, where there are um, different aspects of our society that where you can have really cascading risks. The image that's shown halfway down on the on the right hand side of this slide is um, from one of the flooding events that occurred in recent years and this um, was an electricity substation that came really close um, to being taken offline during one of the severe flooding events. Um, that electricity substation itself provides electricity to 500,000 local homes and businesses but it also provides electricity to the local sewage treatment works for example. Um, and so you start to get these knock-on um, impacts. One of the things that we've been involved in Cambridge um, with is um, talking to um, some of the nat nationally, there are groups of um, local resilience forums, and these are groups of the emergency responders who understand how um, they, could, they need to respond to um, critical risks. And they've been describing to us the ways in which these interconnected risks occur. Um, one example that they were telling us about was um, of severe flooding in London, flash flooding that occurred last summer, and how that didn't just ha have an um, impact on emergency responders in London, but it also put pressure on emergency responders throughout the whole of the rest of the country, as fire services in particular were diverted um, into London from other parts of the, of the region. So really understanding these knock-on impacts is something that we're trying to better understand um, today as well as what the global interconnection associated with these, uh, with climate related risks are. And there's an increasing awareness of the risks um, uh, posed, for example, um, uh, through migration or potential drivers of conflict arising through um, climate change happening in other parts of the world. So that's in terms of the risks to the UK. What about the response of the UK? to climate change. Um, the image at the top here shows um, UK emissions since 1990. Um, and you can look either at our territorial emissions or those emissions that take into account the fact that we buy things from other 
um, locations, so what are called our consumption emissions. But either though, whichever way you account for it, our emissions have fallen um, as a country over the last decades. And then at the same time, our global economy has grown. Um, and this is important because, you know, part of the politics um, of this um, is uh, often trying to, uh, historically has been trying to pose the response of climate change as being something that would impact um, economic growth. And this clearly demonstrates that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. But at the same time, there are real challenges in terms of um, actually reducing our emissions in the UK and indeed internationally in line with those um, Paris Agreement ambitions of keeping temperatures below 1.5 degrees. Um, so this is now looking at those emissions sector by sector across the UK economy. And what you can now see is that most of the emissions reductions that we've seen um, since 1990 have come from the energy supply sector. Pretty much every other sector of the UK economy has seen very little change. You can see a little dip down in the transport um, sector um, in um, the final year that's shown here. This is the last official reported data, which comes from 2020, and that was the pandemic year. So the reason that those emissions in the transport sector saw the dip was largely associated with the, um, the shutting down of, of the UK economy during lockdown periods. All these sectors of the economy need to reach net zero by 2050 if we as a country are to contribute to the emissions reductions that are required globally. So that means a massive change across every sector of our economy. So how on track or not are we to make those changes? Well, the Committee on Climate Change um, had, uh, reports annually um, in terms of our progress uh, as a country in making those emissions reductions. And their most recent report from the summer of this year concluded that although there were good plans in place in the energy sector and in the transport sector, most of the rest of the sectors showed significant risks or completely insufficient plans in terms of <coughs> future emissions reductions. So let me just give you a little bit of insight into the response in some of these critical um, uh, sectors. And I'm taking, again, a very UK-centric um, view here, and we can talk about the global response um, afterwards. So this is looking at surface transport, cars and vans and lorries um, in the UK. They contribute almost a quarter um, of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, to be in line with um, our legal commitments as a country in terms of emissions reductions, uh, they need to reduce 70% uh, over the next um, just over 10 years. And that's a really significant challenge. The good news on transport, though, is that we have um, a cleaner alternative um, for most forms of uh, surface transport in the form of uh, electric vehicles. And electric vehicle rollout is really happening apace across the country, um, particularly in terms of domestic, domestic cars. Um, and so you can see here um, that by Christmas last year, a quarter of all new cars sold in the UK were battery electric um, vehicles. It really is a you know, really amazingly fast transformation. And if there's um, you know, a few areas of hope to draw out of what's often otherwise a very depressing story about climate change is that there are um, aspects in which we can point to where really rapid change has occurred. Um, really rapid change in terms of some of the renewable energy technologies, but also um, uh, uh, electric vehicles is an example where there's been a really dramatic change. Roll back five years ago, and it wasn't the case that all the major um, car manufacturers um, were prioritising electric vehicles. Well, that is the case um, now. And we're seeing that in terms of the numbers of cars actually on the, on the road and the number of countries with plans in place to phase out um, uh, petrol cars. A more difficult area for the UK is in terms of our building stock. Uh, that contributes about 20% of our emissions, depending on exactly how you um, uh, divide things up. 
Um, and those need to reduce by about 50% over the next decade. We're obviously sitting in a middle of, a, of an energy crisis and a cost of living crisis. And so the question of heating our homes is a really um, critical political issue um, at the moment. And it's clear that there are two key aspects associated with that. Um, our housing stock is incredibly poorly insulated, um, typically in the UK. And so energy efficiency measures are a critical part of the solution, as is moving away from fossil fuels as a heating um, source for our, for our homes. And this has been something um, that has been long recognised as being an important issue, but there's been a lamentable history in terms of um, UK policy associated with it. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's estimated that there's around about 30 million buildings um, in the, uh, the UK that require switching the way in which they are being uh, heated. And there is no sense in which we're on track um, in order to do that. So that's a real challenge. And in particular, it's a challenge that requires a really um, systemic solution it's not just about the technology. We essentially know what the different technology um, options are in terms of heating. It's a combination of policy instruments, um, behavioural change, how you understand where the critical barriers to change are and put in place um, measures to overcome them. It might be in terms of financing. It might be in terms of trust of having contractors coming into your homes. There are many different dimensions that need to come together to create an effective policy framework. So that's some of the major challenges. Where are the big opportunities? And I wanted just to highlight some of the areas of research that we're engaged in in, uh, in Cambridge associated with the research side of things, because in many ways, this is the element that makes me most optimistic and indeed most excited because there's a lot of really exciting research being undertaken um, that speaks to all the different areas of um, the economy that need to be transformed giving underpinning technologies to help generate that transformation. And not just underpinning technologies, also using um, academic insight into the critical behavioural changes that need to be accompanying those technological transformations to really transform our society in a fair and just way to a net zero future. So I mentioned um, that there's been huge changes in renewable technologies. A critical um, element of that is in terms of improvements in battery storage. And that's really gathering pace um, in terms of academic research. Really two key areas. One of them I've mentioned already, which is um, electric vehicles. Every electric vehicle has to have um, a battery in it. And um, both in terms of the efficiency of those batteries, but also in terms of the environmental footprint of the batteries um, themselves. There's significant um, uh, research being undertaken to advance those technologies. And the other area of energy storage is at a grid scale, as we have increasing renewable energy um, in terms of our energy generation at a grid scale, there's an increasing need for storage at a grid scale to cope with the fact that uh, you only get wind uh, energy generation when the wind blows or solar when the sun shines. And so um, having grid scale storage is another key area of development. And there's a lot of research being undertaken associated with that. Um, in terms of transport, um, aviation uh, currently is quite a small percentage of global emissions, but is growing um, rapidly. And so there's a lot of interest in looking at how net zero aviation might be developed. Um, one key, obviously, um, uh, element of uh, a future aviation is simply people travelling less. Um, that's the behavioural change um, element associated with it. And actually, one of the positive things uh, that has come out from the pandemic, I think, has been a realisation that a lot of business travel can be conducted instead virtually. And um, and, and that, uh, that could potentially lead to significant reductions in the number of miles travelled. But there are also opportunities for um, new technology as well, either in terms of sustainable aviation fuels or in terms of electric or hydrogen planes, um, and indeed looking at more efficient um, designs of aircraft uh, as well. Third area that I've highlighted here is in terms of greenhouse gas removal um, technologies. 
Um, so this is looking at how we might be able to remove, either by technological or natural means, carbon dioxide or potentially other greenhouse gases um, from the atmosphere. It's really important to understand both the potential technological options associated with that, um, as well as what the potential implications might be um, of some of those technologies. Um, an example that's shown here is, a, is an effectively a, a nature-based um, way of removing um, carbon dioxide, which is to try to grow kelp forests in the ocean. And those kelp forests, in the same as our land-based forests, would soak up carbon dioxide um, at an increased rate. And uh, done right, this could actually help to restore some of our marine ecosystems. But obviously, done wrong, it could significantly perturb some of our marine ecosystems. So there's a significant amount of research being undertaken, both in terms of what the options might be for these greenhouse gas removal technologies um, and approaches, but also how to put in place a, a, an ethical framework associated with them. And the final example that I have here is, I think, a really interesting project that um, I'm involved in leading in, in Cambridge. Um, and there's other in initiatives here in Oxford that are being undertaken in a very similar um, vein, which is looking at future land management. Um, the particular example that's shown here is of the Fenland around East Anglia, which is all ancient reclaimed land. Um, it's all peatland and it's very heavily farmed at present. Um, there are many, many different intersecting issues uh, because it's all reclaimed land, it was drained in the 17th century, much of it's below sea level, so it's very exposed to flooding. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of um, development being occurring in East Anglia, and it's an area of significant water shortages because of low rainfall. So at the same time, you have too much water risk from flooding and too little water um, available um, for uh, drinking water and irrigation. The third key element is that the peatland, um, as it's being intensively farmed, is emitting large amounts of greenhouse gases. And that in itself is linked to the water because in part it's releasing those greenhouse gases because it's no longer waterlogged as it was in its um, un, um, intensively farmed state. And so what we're looking at is working bo out both from a scientific perspective, but also by working closely with the communities who live and work in the Fenlands, what different future land management practices might be available that have benefits both for climate and for the nature, for biodiversity, um, in some very unique um, habitats, as well as for the people who, and communities who live and work in the Fenlands. The Fenlands um, are an area of extreme inequalities. Um, under most indices, they come as one of the most unequal parts of the country. And at the moment, that rural economy is a really important part of the local economy. So it's a nice example, I think, of the complexity of the challenges, but also the huge opportunities by convening all the um, academic experts, but also convening the communities and um, those people who have an intimate knowledge in many senses of um, those landscapes to come up with solutions that are effective into the future. And it feels as though it's a model for what could be happening across many other sectors of the economy as well. Right, I'm just going to wrap up now. I've, what I've tried to do is give you a little tour of um, both the challenges but also some of the responses um, to climate change. This is just as a final note, the response of the University in Cambridge um, to climate change. We've really set um, our response as a university at the heart of the university, speaking to the university's overarching mission, which is to contribute to society. And so we're bringing together and have over the last three years brought together the whole of the university colleges, um, as well as the university and its departments. Uh, across these four key areas, the research that we conduct within the university and looking at how we can integrate that and significantly enhance it, all the education that we provide our students, but also how we can contribute to education beyond our students, uh, both in schools and in terms of um, executive and professional development education. 
all our wider engagements with policy, with business, with industry, with entrepreneurship, as well as our own operations in the university and how, how we can decarbonise those and create um, a more sustainable university in a physical sense. It's actually hugely exciting um, and I, it's been a privilege for me for the last three years to be part of leading um, that initiative, which I think is very much an initiative of hope in the face of what otherwise is, is quite a depressing climate scenario. So let me just end where I started with me here in Magdalen um, 30 years ago. A lot has changed in the last 30 years. 30 years more into the future will be in the middle of the century. And we really have a choice today as both individuals, as communities, as colleges, as universities, um, as countries, and as a global society, uh, as to what future we want over the next 30 years. We have only one Earth, and the choices that we make today will determine the future of that one Earth. Thank you. Uh, Emily, thank you mm. for that fascinating and, and slightly worrying uh, <laughs> talk. Um, I, in fact, I want to start, we, we've had a number of pre-submitted questions and uh, I think um, I have to ask the big one first. Mm. Um, do you agree with Rupert Reid that while societal collapse is not completely inevitable, it's highly likely and that hope lies to an extent in really confronting the true horror of that outcome. That's <laughs> Are we doomed? Are we completely doomed? Well, I, I mean, what I've tried to do today is kind of, you know, give a careful balance through that. And it, you, you could see many of those graphs that I showed, we're clearly heading completely in the wrong direction still, despite having, you know, easily 30 years of very significant warnings as to um, the risks posed by climate change. It's, no, but it, the, 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 in many ways, I've said a few times that climate change is the most predictable and the most preventable global crisis. We know what to do about it. We know that, what, you know that we need to reduce our emissions. In many instances, we have the alternatives available to us. Well, I mentioned electric vehicles. I mean, you know, I mentioned in terms of uh, different renewable energy technologies. Many of the solutions are already there, and it's about having the political will um, to actually enact them. Um, but isn't that exactly the problem? It is, but we can't give up, can we? I mean, well, <laughs> that doesn't feel, you know, it, 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 it's a major challenge. We're about to have the next UN climate conference um, in Egypt. Um, you know, we left last year in Glasgow uh, with the hope that, or well, recognition that countries hadn't put forward pledges that were sufficient to meet the Paris Agreement targets, um, with the hope that countries would come back this year with increased ambition. It's not clear that that's going to happen. Um, the whole question at last year in terms of Glasgow was, you know, one of the catchphrases was, is 1.5 still alive? And it was questionable as to whether it was last year. It's even more questionable this year. It's a challenge. And that's why we need institutions like Oxford and Cambridge to be coming together with that academic expertise, but also leadership. One of the things that I was um, trying to emphasise was the important role that I see universities have in terms of helping to convene the coalitions. It's not, this isn't just about governments taking action. It's about communities coming together, I mean, communities in the broader sense, industry coalitions, um, to get together with those um, political actors to, to create the change that's required. I mean, we're, we're currently in a situation where, just looking at the UK, we, we have a, a, a constant barrage of immediate political and economic crisis. Um, Ukraine, constant unstable changing governments, cost of living crisis, COVID. In the middle of all of that noise, how do you get a government to focus on a longer term issue like climate change that although it's completely predictable and the effects are catastrophic, they're always just far enough away to be pushed out of the front line by the thing that's happening right now? 
Yeah, and, uh, and in many instances, it's about the recognition of the systemic nature of climate change, that many of those issues are in some ways touched by climate change itself. So we're, you know, part of we're, the, the uh, Ukraine has created an energy crisis that would be significantly less severe if we weren't dependent on Russian gas. Um, so but the there's a connection. The immediate reaction was to say, oh, let's all start fracking. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, which makes no sense because it would have been much more sensible if their immediate reaction was, let's start insulating all our homes. So there are choices in all of this. Um, and so it's not just about short term, short termism. And in fact, actually, you know, the critical thing about climate change is that whilst the impacts may be playing out over decades and centuries, it's the decisions that are made today that are going to determine that. So it really is a short term issue and an immediate one. Uh, I'm sure there are questions in the room. We've got some roving mics. If you want to put your hand up. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Rachel Stancliffe uh, and I run a charity called the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So I care a lot about these things. Um, so given that this is an existential, existential crisis and um, I've, as you said, there's only, I don't know, 10, 20 years left in which to act. Do you think we're funding the right kind of research? Mm, that's also a good question. Actually, an area of research that I think has had you know, not nearly as much attention as it ought to have done um, until relatively recently is the connection between climate change and health. Um, and um, both in terms of the connections with public health, um, you know, we know, again, there's some of these connections in terms of the benefits. Uh, electric vehicles don't entirely eliminate um, the health impacts of, of cars, but uh, the, the in, in general, air pollution is a really significant cause of global health um, related issues. We know that cycling and walking is healthier than, than sitting in a car. Um, but at the same time, there's increased recognition of um, many health related aspects in terms of disease, many different types of um, disease. Uh, one of um, the ones that my colleagues in Cambridge were telling me about um, just in the last couple of weeks um, was an it's starting to be an understanding that um, antimicrobial resistance um, is particularly connected with climate change because one of the key drivers of antimicrobial resistance is um, in uh, regions that have been significantly flooded. So the, the sort of floods that we've seen in, in Pakistan and Bangladesh um, recently are sort of hot spots for driving antimicrobial resistance. So even that has a connection through to climate change. So understanding those health and climate change connections and then understanding how to put in place measures to create those systems in a more resilient way um, is one area of research that is now starting to receive more um, funding and attention, but how, you know, so somewhat surprisingly, I think, hasn't been um, over, over you know, the past 30 years. So, uh, th thank you for an extremely interesting and extremely depressing talk. Um, I've got a couple of questions, if I may. First of all, um, it was quite nice to see the graphs going generally downwards for the UK, but does it actually matter at all what, hap what those graphs do here in the UK? Um, set in the context of what the same lines might be doing on a worldwide basis? Um, and should our focus be more on getting the rest of the world to push in the right direction? And the second question is, I was very excited by the picture of the um, Airbus Zero E. Uh, is that a real plane? Is it electric? How far does it go? Can you ride in it? Or is it just a drawing? Thank you. Um, so, it does, uh, you know, the UK is only a small percentage of, a relatively small percentage of current global emissions. Does it matter what the UK does? Um, well, it, I mean, it does matter, not least because actually when the UK's emissions go down, we are part of a global economy. We're buying and trading all those, uh, you know, goods associated with those different parts of the um, of those economic sectors in a global sense. And so what we do ends up having um, an impact on, on other economies as well. So it's not, we're not acting in isolation. Um, so, you know, it clearly it is important. It's important to be able to be 
a demonstrator for how change can happen in, within a country and, and, and to, sh you know, to show leadership in that sense. Um, but it's also huge opportunities and this is where the jobs and the you know, economic benefit comes in associated with um, uh, many of those changes. And we've seen that in terms of some of the critical um, technologies and where you know, the question about where research areas um, uh, can be focused. There are many opportunities that start from the research and then lead up into um, huge economic opportunities um, and you know, renewable energy technologies, battery technologies. They'll either be developed here in the UK or they'll be developed in other parts of the world. And China in particular is already leading the way on many um, uh, renewable energy technologies. So that in itself comes with risks in terms of shifting geopolitical landscapes, but that's, an, that's another, uh, another story. In terms of the aviation sector itself, my understanding is that electric planes are a viable option for short haul, um, uh, you know, essentially today. Um, but when you're talking about longer haul, then different, different options are gonna be required. There's only so far that you can fly an electric plane. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is David Cole. I'm, uh ex-graduate from Wadham, so I'm something, something of an interloper here today. But I've seen you, the, the evidence you've presented showing the, uh, you know, the Earth is warming and that the CO2 is increasing, and that increase is due to the uh, combustion of fossil fuels. I think there's, there's no, no doubt about that. What, I, what is lacking is the attribution of CO2 to that temperature increase. It has been assumed that the temperature is increasing because the CO2 is increasing. Now, there's a growing body of evidence based on analysis of atmospheric absorption capability using a database known as the HITRAN database of infrared gaseous spectral, spectral absorption. This suggests that CO2 is not the driver of climate change. And the reason being is the impact of water vapour. Water vapour is the, is the elephant in the room. The absorption characteristics of water vapour are sufficiently strong to, effect, strong to effectively totally overlap those of carbon dioxide, with the result that increasing levels of CO2 will have only a limited effect on increasing infrared absorption. And the result is there will be a limited increase in temperature. The latest papers that are using this type of calculation are suggesting that the climate sensitivity to a doubling of CO2 is less than one degree, as opposed to the figures up, upwards of four and a half, five degrees issued by the IPCC. If that is the case, then why are we doing what we are doing? So the... Uh, the um Atmospheric chemistry and the understanding of the atmospheric chemistry um, associated with greenhouse, the greenhouse effect is incredibly well understood. And as you rightly point out, uh, water vapour is a really critical element of that. Um, so as you increase the temperature, um, then the, uh, the amount of, uh, of water vapour that an at the atmosphere is able to, to hold um, changes. And water vapour it itself is a greenhouse gas and so it acts as a, an amplification of the of the greenhouse effect um, water vapor itself it, you know you, the, there is a sort of fixed amount of water vapor according to the temperature of the atmosphere that can be held in the atmosphere more than that and then you start, it falls out as rain so it's different to um, other what we call greenhouse gases carbon dioxide and methane and so forth in terms of the impacts but the Attribution, as you point out, uh, as you put it, between um, our emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and then the impact in terms of the increased temperature is incredibly well understood from multiple different perspectives now. But we, we, we have no control over the water vapour in the atmosphere, totally out of our control. But increasing the amount of water vapour, even if we could, would have very little effect on infrared so, absorption. So maybe because, I can suggest because that you the, talk to... The, spec, the absorption spectra of water vapour is already pretty well fully saturated. You could double the amount of water vapour and not see any 
major impact. So you're, t you're sitting in front of or uh, behind um, one of the key experts on exactly this area. So maybe I can suggest that you talk to Miles Allen Alan. after the <laughs> after the lecture. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for that, Emily, and I might make a shameless plug for my uh, Gresham lecture on the atmospheric physics behind net zero, which addresses precisely this question on uh, November the 22nd, Gresham College in London, but also available online. That was not staged. <laughs> um, and, uh, and by the way, you're in very good company. This, this mistake was made by Ungström, the Swedish uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, over 100 years ago and actually uh, uh, resulted in Arrhenius's CO2 theory being dismissed for about 50 years um, before Gilbert Plass in the 1950s realized that actually Armstrong was wrong and where energy exchange with space matters in the high atmosphere, water vapor is actually very scarce and the air is very cold and so increasing CO2 does actually matter. Um, so, so, but, but do, do, do join me on uh, November the 22nd and we can go through the physics in detail. Um, but I had a question for Emily as well. If, if, uh, he seized the mic and he won't let it go now, is he? Um, uh, would, you, would you like to give a supplementary? No, 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 that, 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 that's, that, that, that's the end of the commercial break. Uh, <laughs> sorry, um, go on. Miles Allen, Oxford Net Zero. Um, and uh, uh, the number you didn't mention um, is, I mean, you, you alluded to the fact that, you know, fossil fuels are still more than 80% of global primary energy supply. And the aggregate profits made by the fossil fuel industry is, nobody's quite sure what it is, but it's several percent of global GDP, more than enough to stop the products they sell from causing global warming. But we don't talk about the problem that way. We talk about the problem in terms of what consumers can do. Whereas the agency in all this lies entirely with the producers. They could stop global warming now if they had the incentive to do so. How can we get the environmental community, the climate science community, the political community perhaps, making this clearer to everybody? So, I don't know, Miles. I mean, there are, I, I try to say that there are from my perspective, I'm trying to lay out the different evidence base. And I try to avoid saying this is the way, this is the particular way that we ought to be going about addressing it. So the, the way that you laid out of, let's say, let, you know, let's take the, the producers and say, you know, effectively, you've been the cause of this problem, you should pay to solve the problem. It, you know, that's one route through this, and it might be, you know, quite an attractive route through this, but there is a spectrum of other ways that we could also get through this. Um, and, uh, you know, you could also say, well, yes, they're the producers, but we're the consumers, you know, maybe we have a role in, but, you know, so I try to be non-judgmental. <laughs> and, I, and that's just the way that I approach it, and I know that, that you approach it in a different way. So. I, I, there's not, a, you know, there isn't a single solution to this. Um, there are solutions that you might think are more attractive or less attractive. Um, that under, well, no, underlying all of it, though, is the this critical issue that's been, you know, long, long recognised that the major challenge with all of this from an economic perspective is that we haven't been accounting properly for the damage caused by um, fossil, the use of fossil fuels in particular. Um, and so accounting for those, properly accounting for those externalities really lies at the heart of all of this. And yours is a potential solution effectively for how to go about doing that. So really what, what Miles is saying is you've got a massive externality in the system, which is that the polluter doesn't pay. Yeah. And, and that's sort of basic mm -hmm. economics, really. Um, but that requires a government that has the political will well, place international the community to has the political will to place a financial burden on, on the producers. Yeah, and so that's a, you know, and in terms of you know there being a sort of a range of different potential solutions that are um, available in terms of that response. That you know, it 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 does. There is a spectrum that goes from the sorts of models that Miles is just describing to you know through some sort of carbon tax or carbon pricing, and you know, there's a spectrum of different approaches that 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 you know, that are put forward as being potential um, 
potential ways of addressing that, those externalities, the fact that those externalities aren't accountable. And I wanted to ask you another of the pre-submitted pre questions, which comes from Phoebe Reed uh, from New College. Uh, she asked the question, how do we get people out of their cars? And I, I wanted to supplement that question because we talked a lot about electric cars, but I wonder, are electric cars a sort of a, a false gleam of hope? Because of course the manufacture of electric cars is, you know, has, has a very significant carbon footprint. And do we even have enough resources for all the batteries that we need for the electric cars and for all the electricity that will be needed to power them? It, it, is, is Phoebe right? Do we need to give up the idea of private cars altogether? Well, the, I mean, well, let's just take a few of those th things a bit at a time. So in terms of the environmental footprint of a new car and, it's bat you know, if it's a battery, um, electric car, the battery associated with it, then that, that is something that, you know, of course, one has to be really um, conscious of. And as I was describing, one of the key areas of battery technology research is precisely about looking at the environmental footprint of those of those batteries so that's that is a critical issue in terms of how do we get people out of cars um, the uh, one of the things that I was trying to um, highlight through the example I gave, gave with the land management um, and the future of land management is the really systemic nature of many of these challenges and the need to look at things in a really broad sense. So how do we get people out of cars? I mean, of course, in part, it's about, you know, encouraging more active forms of transport, but it's also about uh, public transport infrastructure. Um, it's not just about the transport system, but it's also about the broader, um, uh, um, the bro broader planning environment. Um, so, you know, if you live in a region where you can, um, walk or cycle to your the critical infrastructure to your school or to you know the whatever healthcare um, uh, you require um, or to the critical shops that you require if that if you design a, a neighborhood in that sense that allows that and that needn't be directly to do with the transport system but it's about setting it in a broader context mm -hmm. um, it's also about you know looking at behavioral you know their behavioral psychology and drawing on from the research associated with that, so how do you encourage and stimulate people to, to change the way in which they, um, they, they live their lives. It's about how can we use technology to help um, create different forms of mobility. We've seen um, the ways in which technology is used um, to create um, the sort of cycle schemes and, and scooter schemes that exist in many places that allow more on-demand travel than, than has been traditionally um, available. So there's lots of different components that need to come together um, and that's where it gets exciting because that's where actually there's you know it starts to conceptually get quite exciting about how do we design a different future yes andrew thank you yeah i just wanted to pick up on the topic you were dealing with at the end on the um landscape solutions or the nature-based solutions because i thought what was very interesting was that you highlighted that um the way forward or the path is pretty clear um, in, for example, the transport sector, the move towards electrification or other you know, forms of energy consumption that are not based on net consumption of fossil fuels. Similarly, with um, improving the energy efficiency of um, heating our homes and buildings, that path is pretty clear. And I just wondered if you could expand a little bit on what you've learned perhaps in the last few years through your interactions with policymakers about the path forward in terms of nature-based solutions because I was interested that you described it in a little remark near the end as a political opportunity. Um, I mean, I think at the moment it seems like a bit of a political nightmare <laughs> because our leaders are currently saying that, you know, we're going to do all this, we're going to improve biodiversity, we're going to restore nature, we're going to improve nature as a carbon sink at the same time as dramatically improving our food production in the UK, improving the livelihoods of our farmers, giving farmers pay payments for you know, biodiversity offsets. And it seems to me at the moment there's a, a gamish and there isn't a very clear way forward, certainly at a political level. And I was wondering if you could just expand on what your reflections would be on the, where we currently stand on those policy related issues. Yeah, so I so th this project that we've been undertaking um, 
I think has been, well, I found it really, really exciting as a potential model, frankly, for how um, actually we could be trying to take, you know, identify the win, 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 wins. Um, and, and so, and I think that at the heart of it has been actually genuinely doing what we often talk about in academic circles, but rarely actually do properly, which is co-design and co-production of solutions. So um, in that example that I gave of the Fen Fenlands, historically the farming community and the conservation community have literally been at war with each other because they you know, have different desires for the future of the, of the land. Um, but they both have, both groups have huge knowledge about the land and you know many instances there really are very important local um, considerations um, and those are two critical groups but there are many other critical groups in terms of the other different users and people who live in in, in those landscapes including the critical users of the, in terms of the of the natural world um, and what we started to find by um, really engaging and and bringing those different groups together is that we've started to find that there are really potential routes forward that are at least acceptable and palatable to um, multiple different groups and they really like being involved and helping to find the solutions so for example um, one of the uh, um, uh, approaches that's often used or suggested in terms of reducing the emissions from the peatlands is to re-wet the the peatlands. The farmers hate that because they think that this is grade one agricultural land that's being taken away from agricultural use and put into some, you know, eco project that they can see no benefit um, of. Um, what we're starting to look at, though, is, and this was originally suggested by the farmers who understand their, their, their fields, is essentially whether you can do the equivalent of a crop rotation. So the thing, key thing about the Fenlands is because you have all the drainage ditches, you can literally change the water table on a field by field level. So you can potentially do something where you essentially change those on a rotation basis. So you only flood some of the fields and not other fields and rotate them around in terms of the... So that's an example of a potential future that's been um, designed by the farmers in consultation with the conservation communities. And then we're looking from a scientific perspective as to whether or not that genuinely would have the, the benefits that we're doing a number of trials of exactly that sort of approach. But I mean, it's it really what struck me having been involved in this work over the last couple of years is how powerful it is to bring these different groups together. Yeah. And, and I do think that universities can have a key role there in terms of being the conveners. Um, of those different groups. Uh, to be honest, this, the aviation example um, that I gave, underlying that is a similar bringing together of the entire aviation sector, not just the engine manufacturers and the, and the um, aircraft manufacturers, um, but also the airports um, and all the different companies that are involved in the supply chain, including the fuel, to come back to some of the uh, Mars' enemies, some of the fuel producers as well. Um, all together to look in a much more holistic sense about how we can bring together some of the solutions. It feels as though that's, the, you know, a critical part of the route forward and also something that's critical for in terms of the role that universities can play. That's fascinating. And we, we last year had a lecture from James Rebanks, the uh, farmer in the Lake District, who was also uh, an alumnus of, of Maudlin. And uh, he's been very much involved. He's, he's an upland farmer of uh, cattle and sheep and he's been very much involved in projects for land sharing mm -hmm. where uh, improving the um, water work the, the ways that the water moves across his land uh, planting lots more hedgerows so you have trees that don't prevent agriculture but you have cows and sheep interacting with more trees and also ways of uh, grazing that um, mean that the soil takes up more carbon and yeah no 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 yeah exactly and then and then the key you know so those are the solutions and then it needs to yeah. fit within the policy framework as well and the financial incentives framework also i think i should say i don't think the producers are miles's enemies they're really what he sees as his cash cows aren't they miles? <laughs> 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 um i think we've got time for yes yes just lady there 
Thank you. Hi. So this is quite specific to Oxford and Cambridge, and particularly Cambridge Zero. So Oxford has a zero carbon target, which is great. But a lot of the colleges like that make up Oxford are still invested in fossil fuels, and <coughs> very few of them have a strategy. I was just wondering, do you think this kind of disparity between colleges and the central uni matters in terms of this? And if so, how do you navigate that? So I can't speak for Oxford because I'm not familiar enough with Oxford, but um, Cambridge Zero is very much a collegiate university initiative. So we count the colleges as just as much being part of the initiative as the university. And in terms of the decarbonisation in its broadest sense, not just the, um, uh, the uh, uh, buildings, and, and infrastructure, but also the investments, as you describe. Um, we've been uh, looking very much at the university, but also how we support all the colleges in terms of, in terms of that. Um, and so um, some of the initiative, well, one of the big initiatives actually at the moment that's being undertaken um, centrally in the university, but we're sharing the learning out into the colleges as well, is around um, our offsetting policies. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is put that on a much more robust footing, um, drawing one, one of the key things that we've been doing across all of this is where can we draw on academic expertise from within the university to help define policies that the university then enacts. And as I say, making sure that that's um, across the university itself, uh, interfacing with all the colleges, but also with the other um, assets of the university, so Cambridge University Press and Assessment, uh, the University Hospital, uh, we're just um, looking to build a new children's hospital and we're hoping that's going to be the first net zero hospital in the country um, in terms of it, the, the construction and operation of the, of the hospital. Um, so we're, we're trying to do it at, a, you know, at the scale of the greater university rather than just focus on the central university. How much communication is there between Oxford and Cambridge on these initiatives? Because it seems like you, you have a huge amount of expertise. To what extent are you sharing those with colleagues in Oxford rather oh, than well, everybody inventing we, we, we know. Miles and I talk to each other. So, uh, I, 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 well, so I mean, it's definitely at, at all the different levels. So in terms of the research, yes. Um, in terms of uh, the question that I was just asked, in terms of the decarbonisation at the uh, at the university level, then that, there is also good uh, collaborations between not just Oxford and Cambridge, but actually universities oh, yeah, across the UK. Yeah. Um, because it would seem sensible that the, well, these these are initiatives that should be at least national, probably global. Mm -hmm. um, and I sometimes wonder if you have little centres of excellence that are all kind of generating lots of stuff when everything needs to be more joined up. Yeah, and I, I think there's more joined up that we could do, undoubtedly. One of the things that um, we helped to organise, which happened because we were hosting COP26, the big climate conference in Glasgow last year, was a network of UK universities. Um, so together with Imperial, we helped co-found um, that network. And um, initially, it was just about bringing together the research community in support of COP26. Um, but it very quickly emerged that for all these other reasons, there was also a strong interest in collaboration. And that network's continued beyond um, uh, COP26. And we now have a, a UK climate, um, university climate network that spans um, not just um, research, um, decarbonisation of uh, the universities and their estates, um, but also things like green careers. So many of the, and education in, within the, the universities. Um, so there's lots of different ways, both nationally and, as you say, internationally, in which actually creating networks and sharing expertise and knowledge is, is really central. I think we've got time for one more, one more question. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk, by the way. Um, I agree with a lot, lot of what you say. Years ago, I built my own solar panels. So I'm not really a complete sceptic, although I am very concerned about the politics behind all this as well. It's not just science. Uh, we've had Al Gore saying all the summer ice was supposed to have gone by 2013 as he handed his Nobel Prize. Um, um, we've got David Attenborough who's implying that the polar bears are sort of dying off and the walruses are all sort of drying out and dying, which is all complete nonsense. They're, they're doing extremely well. Now, I don't know whether you're happy about that, but we've also got, there's a, there's a sign of it in the science, in the way that 
uh, your projection had one little graph sh showing how um, temperatures might increase during this current century, uh, going possibly up to four and a half to five degrees. Now, this, this presumably relates rather to the idea of the climate sensitivity of carbon dioxide being between one and a half and four and a half degrees per doubling. It sort of rather relates to that, I feel. But these, these same kind of models have been in existence since the whole start of this sort of current period of 50 years, since 1973. And someone in the, on the internet has been researching, a respected researcher, um, and 36 different climate modelings, which have been in use during this 50-year period, predicting uh, an increase per decade of between 0.2 and pretty well up to 0.5 degrees. Well, the actual average uh, increase per decade has been 0.2, approximately, plus or minus. So these, these modelings are out there, and people are worried by this. And you're showing them on your graph. Now, I, I do think there's, there's a strong political dimension. David Attenborough's recent series, Frozen Planet 2, the, the producer of this series had been interviewed uh, and admitted openly that he's using emotional images to goad people into, into taking on this sort of sense of urgency. Now, I honestly, I think this is completely scurrilous and unacceptable in what's supposed to be a sober scientific um, approach to, to our planet. Now, how would you feel about that? Um, so let me just pick up on a couple of the, of the things there. The, the graph that I showed um, came from the IPCC report, um, and the graph was showing climate model uh, projections um, for the rest of this century under a, a number of different future emissions scenarios. And the one that shows the highest temperature is obviously that that's associated with the highest emissions under that scenario. These are just potential future storylines of, of, um, of emission scenarios to give a sense of if this is the amount of emissions you put into the atmosphere, this is the amount of um, temperature change that you will see. It's not supposed to be a forecast as such as to what the potential future is. It's supposed to be a tool with which to understand what um, the degree of severity would be under different policy futures. Um, and uh, the, if you look closely, you would have seen that there's a range associated with each of those projections. It wasn't a solid line um, because the, um, our, a broad range of different modelling centres from around the world who all run the same simulations and they um, have come up with slightly different results because each of the models are slightly different and that gives the scientific uncertainty associated with that. Um, in terms of the natural world and the frozen planet, and I don't know whether well, probably many people have been watching the, the latest uh, David Attenborough series, um, you know, the sad truth is that, as I said earlier, particularly um, uh, species that live in the polar regions are genuinely very susceptible to changes in climatic conditions. Um, and as I described, if you're already in the coldest part of the world, you simply can't just move your habitat ranges as that world um, warms up. And one of the key things that was highlighted a number of times, I watched Frozen Planet with my, with my two daughters, as I was um, explaining earlier. Um, one of the things that was highlighted a number of times in that um, program is that it's not just the immediate impact of a changing ecosystem on one species, it's the interactions between them. It's how um, seasonal changes can then affect the way in which a critical um, species that is the food source for another species may be emerging at the wrong time um, of year and so you start to get these seasonal discrepancies and that has an impact um, on uh, different species. So the episode that I was lo watching with my children um, at the weekend um, was describing how caribou, I don't know whether people saw this, um, caribou um, are potentially at risk because um, as the um, tundra is melting, then um, there's the melt, melt pool, pools are a source of um, breeding ground for mosquitoes that are they're then attacking the caribou. And they wouldn't normally have been attacked by the mosquitoes because normally that land would have been frozen and, you know, and so forth. So sometimes these really critical um, interconnections can, um, you know, often in ways that we simply haven't appreciated or understood before, are already having major impacts on uh, species, many of which are endangered for other reasons or their habitats are be already being uh, under pressure for, for other reasons. So climate change is, you know, there's a good reason why 
It's been um, something that's been brought up time and time again within Frozen Planet in the most recent series. And it's because sadly, as you saw in one of my images, the polar regions are um, among the fastest changing parts of the planet and the species that live there genuinely are being significantly affected. Uh, I want to thank you, Emily, for a real tour de force, uh, extraordinary scope of your talk, the lucidity with which you've described uh, the implications of the path that we're on and the options that are open to us uh, to change it. Um, I think the, the importance of what you're saying is absolutely overwhelming and it's uh, sobering and important for us all to have heard that message. And thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, we're very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you.